Actually, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor, Pro Professor Donald Pfaff. He is a professor at Rockefeller University in New York City, where I incidentally started my own career. And uh, he's the lab, uh, the head of the Laboratory of Neurobiology and Behavior, and the title of his talk is The Central Neuro Foundations of Awareness and Self-Awareness. Professor Pfaff. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this wide and diverse meeting in which we can consider the possibility of certain uh, universal concepts. I'd like to divide my discussion into four parts. Uh, first, because parts of my talk are highly speculated, I would like to start out and gain a little credibility by saying we really do know how to uh, analyze mechanisms for mammalian behaviors. But then, I'll enlarge the subject a lot to talk about a, a new concept that I call generalized CNS arousal. First we'll discover, discuss it at the conceptual level, and then I'll give you a very brief review of mechanisms that underlie generalized CNS arousal, neural, molecular, and even a little bit of mathematics. And then I'll end up with something which is perhaps closest to the topic of this meeting, namely CNS arousal and self-awareness at, at the clinical level. So, uh, I'd like to start by considering mechanisms for a very simple hormone-dependent behavior, an estrogen-dependent behavior, which is a sex behavior. And it's the behavior by which a four-footed female animal, rats, mice, cows, and so forth, control reproduction. And what we did was we took uh, tritiated estrogens or androgens, and we injected them systemically, and we found out where are the nerve cell groups that express estrogen receptors or androgen receptors and thus retain the radioactive hormones in the cell? So what you're looking at here is what we call a sagittal section through the rat brain. We're looking at the rat brain from the left side. Here's the front of the brain, the olfactory bulb up here. Here's the cerebellum. Here's the spinal cord. And this section at the bottom is right along the middle of the brain. And then this section, also looked at from the left side, is farther out toward the edge of the brain. And what we discovered in the rat brain uh, was a limbic hypothalamic system of sex hormone binding neurons. What that means is here we have the hypothalamus right here over the pituitary gland, and, but we also have neurons that are in the uh, phylogenetically ancient portions of the forebrain. For example, the basal forebrain here, the septum here, and you've heard about the amygdala up here. That's the limbic system. And this limbic hypothalamic system, limbic hypothalamic system of sex hormone binding cells was discovered in rat brain, but it turned out to be universal. Uh, fish, uh, frogs, uh, lizards, birds, mammals, right up through human beings. I like to say from the fish to the philosopher, you can see the sex hormone binding cells in the hypothalamus and the limbic system. Now, discovering them was important, especially discovering the ones right here in the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus because that formed one anchor by which we could work out the discovery of the entire neural circuit for this very simple ordosis behavior. So one anchor of discovery was the estro radioactive estrogen going to the ventral medial nucleus of the hypothalamus. But the other ways in which we could work out the circuit were to start from the sensory stimuli, which are tactile stimuli, and work our way in using neuroanatomical and electrophysiological techniques and the third anchor, the third important anchor, was the, the motor response itself. We could discover which muscles executed this lordosis behavior and work our way backwards using neuroanatomical and electrophysiological techniques and back up the pathways in order to discover the entire circuit. Now it turns out that there's an awful lot of machinery in the spinal cord, but the spinal uh, cord by itself cannot manage lordosis behavior. If you cut the cord here, no lordosis behavior will occur. Instead, there's a spinal, midbrain spinal loop. There's ascending fibers that come up to the medullary reticular formation in the hindbrain. You'll hear me talking about this later, and even going to the midbrain. And what the hypothalamus does is that it sends an estrogen-dependent, a hormone-dependent gating signal back down to the midbrain, telling the midbrain that it can tell the medullary reticular formation 
to govern the spinal cord such that this response will occur. Now at that point we got lucky because it turned out that the, <clears throat> that the hormone receptors that I had discovered in the brain are genetic transcription factors. And so we were able to do a lot of molecular biology over a period of about 15 years. And uh, this list has two properties. This list of genes has two properties. One is that estrogens binding to either estrogen receptor alpha or its gene duplication product, estrogen receptor beta, turn these, on, turn these genes on all the way down to here in the hypothalamus of the preoptic area. That's one property. And the second property is that the gene products govern female reproductive behaviors. Um, so at that point, what we had was a series of findings, starting with the receptors, going to the genes, and the genes turned on and those hypothalamic neurons governing the entire circuit, in order to explain how this very simple reproductive behavior works. Lordosis behavior is a vertebral dorsiflexion. Uh, by doing that, she allows the male to fertilize. Without lordosis behavior, there's no reproduction at all. So speaking in more general terms, uh, wrapping up this first part of the talk, is that we now understand how steroid hormones coordinate brain function with the rest of the body in order to ensure reproduction in these lower animals uh, is re appropriate to the environment. And more generally, just to talk about my field of hormone action on the brain, we understand mechanisms in detail uh, from the smallest mechanisms, the ligand binding pits of these hormone receptors are measured in angstroms, all the way through the seasonality of reproduction in these lower animals uh, governed by mechanisms in which we deal with light years. The result of uh, this work was to prove for the first time uh, that specific biochemical reactions in specific nerve cells of the mammalian brain uh, determine a biologically crucial behavior. Now the purpose of starting with such a simple behavior as you just saw is that when I began this work, uh, serious neurophysiologists felt that it was impossible to study mammalian behaviors. You had to study uh, Drosophila or uh, C. elegans, very, or, or snails, very lower animals. But I wanted to study a mammalian behavior uh, to remain relevant to medicine, and therefore I had to start with a real simple one. And so is it possible to explain mechanisms for mammalian behavior? The answer is yes. But now for the second part of the talk, I'd like to open up the discussion and say, can we approach mechanisms for the fundamental force in the CNS, central nervous system, which underlies all mammalian behaviors? And I'll argue with you uh, that the answer is yes. The argument goes something like this that the ability of sex hormones to turn on reproductive behaviors when all other aspects of the experiment are held constant is proof positive of the ability of sex hormones to elevate sexual motivation. Now, if you look at the literature on motivational mechanisms, whether it's animals or human beings, uh, motivational mechanisms are always divided into two parts. Specific, motivated, specific motivational states, which in our case would be affiliative motivational states and sexual motivational states, but also more generalized motivational states accounting for the activation of any behavior, and that usually goes under the name arousal. In turn, arousal states are usually split into two components. One would be particular components, alertness, activity, emotional reactivity, but the other would be more generalized components akin to, but not necessarily identical to, the sleep-wake cycle. Now, for a person who studies hormone actions of the brain, this is already getting exciting because we knew from previous work that uh, sex hormones could influence sensory alertness, motor activity, and emotional reactivity. So, so that's a reason for studying it. But even more general and more universal are, is this generalized motivational state. And um, the reason that it's exciting is that it's at the base of all cognitive function and all emotional function. You can be aroused without being alert, but you can't be alert without your central nervous system being aroused. You can be alert without paying attention. It's probably happening right now. Uh, but you cannot be atten attentive without being alert. So on up the uh, abstraction level of these cognitive functions until we're talking about decision making, executive decision making, which relies upon all of these underlying functions. And I like to start at the bottom where, where things begin. Likewise with emotional expression. Whether you're expressing your emotions on a lifetime basis due to your temperament, according to your mood, or according to your feeling at the moment, the, uh, it, it depends upon arousal. 
if emotional behavior were viewed as a vector, the angle of the vector might depend upon the person toward whom you're expressing it, whether it's love or hate or whatever. But the length of the vector is going to depend upon the, uh, the amplitude of the behavior, which is a function of arousal. Now, because arousal, CNS arousal, is so important, when something goes wrong with CNS arousal mechanisms, there's an incredible host of medical and public health problems. The most obvious would be the stuporous or vegetative state or comatose state that I'll speak about at the very end of my talk. But likewise, the dementia of aging, the apathy of Alzheimer's, attention deficit disorder, some aspects of autism, uh, all depend upon normal CNS arousal, or shall I say disorders of, the, of CNS arousal. Usually, when we have problems with arousal, it's that we need more arousal, but sometimes we need less. Anesthesia uh, uh, depends upon decreased arousal. In the United States, 15 to 20 percent of the adult population at any given time has some kind of sleep disorder. Mood disorders are obvious arousal problems, depression. What about vigilance problems in the military or dangerous shift work? Public health problems, lead in the water, mercury in the water, and fatigue states, for example, chronic fatigue, immune disorder syndrome, all have to do with CNS arousal. So I'm very pleased that by extending the work of the lab to this arousal concept, uh, we're dealing with something which is of central importance to medicine and public health. So it's very important but also, the concept seemed to me to have a certain slippery and vague property. What I had to do, therefore, was to come up with an operational definition of generalized arousal of the central nervous system, which is precise and complete and leads to physical quantitative measures. And the, the uh, 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 definition that we've started with, uh, which is published in this book over here from Harvard University Press, uh, I put it in red on the board, uh, is that a more generally aroused animal or human being is more alert to sensory stimuli in all modalities, all sensory modalities. The uh, individual is emitting more voluntary motor activity and the individual is more reactive emotionally. And we, uh, th this is intuitively simple in the sense that we can imagine individuals at both ends of the continuum. We can imagine the fidgety individual who's very alert to sensory stimuli and very expressive emotionally. And we can also imagine people, for example, in a hypothyroid state uh, who are not very alert, who are sluggish, and who have a flat emotional disposition. And we have a high throughput assay uh, for all aspects of that definition that operate. We have a high throughput assay for mice, uh, which is all computerized. Uh, which measures alertness to sensory stimuli, motor activity 24-7, and more reactive emotion. I'd like to formulate the problem. This, is not, this equation is not a statement of achievement. It's a statement of the way we'd like to formulate the problem in the future as we have more data. And what it says is that the arousal of any animal or any human being at any given moment is a compound function of a generalized arousal state which is multiplied by, I think it's some kind of multiplicative or exponential function of a whole bunch of specific arousal sources. For example, sexual arousal, or hunger, or fear, or pain. And I don't really mean by these positive, these plus signs that I expect anything to be additive or linear. I just wanted to indicate some kind of increase in function. And principal components analysis of mouse behavior in my lab indicated that uh, uh, among all arousal forces, that in those particular mice, in those particular experiments, generalized arousal uh, forces accounted for about one-third of the variance, which would mean that two-thirds of the variance, or two-thirds of the data, would be accounted for by some kind of complicated function of these other more specific arousal states. And you can imagine that over the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to be working very hard to figure out how these arousal states and their interactions with each other uh, 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 cooperate in order to control the arousal of the individual. The third part of the talk now gives you a very brief review. I wouldn't have dared to start this extremely abstract, extremely ambitious program if I didn't already know, all the way back to my graduate training, that we knew more about these arousal conditions than most modern neuroscientists thought about. Most modern neuroscientists want to deal with the third nucleotide from the left, or perhaps a dendritic spine. But what I wanted to do, having succeeded with a very specific behavior, is to go for the most global concept of all. And I could do it uh, because we already know quite a lot, as you will see. I'll start with neuroanatomical facts. I'll move on briefly to neurophysiological facts. 
I'll talk about work from our lab which has to do with the functional genomics of CNS arousal, and I'll finish up with just a wee bit of information theory. Let's start with the neuroanatomy with the ascending activating systems that support generalized CNS arousal. Norepinephrine systems tend to go to the posterior cortex and are required for normal alertness. Dopamine goes more toward the anterior cortex and is responsible for activating directed motor acts towards salient stimuli. Serotonin is an emotional, uh, important, emotionally important transmitter par excellence. Uh, it goes especially to the limbic forebrain, which I talked about at the beginning, and to the frontal cortex. And histamine also is an arousal transmitter uh, par excellence produced by cells in the hypothalamus and, an, and ascending, going anterior into the brain. And finally, acetylcholine in the basal forebrain drenches the cerebral cortex and is absolutely necessary uh, for normal cognitive activities. Now, these ascending systems are quite famous. Uh, Swedish neuroanatomists discovered most of them. Uh, but descending uh, motor activities, are, uh, descending uh, influences are also important. For example, these histamine neurons in the tuberous <coughs> mammillary nucleus of the hypothalamus descend as well as ascend. Uh, lesions, shall I say, null mutations in your orexin gene, also called hypocretin gene, would turn you into a narcoleptic patient. Uh, mutations in either these genes or the receptors which receive the gene products uh, uh, will, will, will cause narcolepsy. In the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, there are neurons that descend to autonomic controls in the brainstem and the spinal cord, likewise in the preoptic area. So, um, arousal, is, uh, uh, arousal systems are universal among uh, vertebrate brains. They have ascending as well as descending components. They're bilateral. If you have a stroke in one side of your brain, let's say the left side, you are not turned into a comatose patient. The right side can step in and vice versa. If you have a stroke in arousal systems on both sides of the brain, uh, you better make it to the hospital very fast. Um, and they always potentiate responses. This led to a joking summary called Burp Theory, which is also in this Harvard University Press book. As I turn now to neurophysiological mechanisms, I'm going to concentrate on the lower brainstem, just above the spinal cord. And the reason is, first, that they're very important, these cells down there. And the second is that that is the location of my favorite cells of all. These are large cells in the reticular formation of the lower, uh, lower uh, brainstem. Uh, which have axons which bifurcate. They go both anterior, as would be expected to control cerebral cortical arousal, and they have a branch that goes posterior, as though they were going to control autonomic arousal. I don't know for sure that they do, but I know that they look as though they do, and so we're going to study them in just a moment. There are five examples here, but I'll just lead you through one other. Here's a large cell body, it's a giant cell, and in the brainstem reticular formation, and its axons come here, cross the midline, one branch goes anterior, one branch goes posterior. Now already from several other laboratories, we knew that the neurophysiology of nerve cells in this part of the brain were exactly what you would uh, expect if these nerve cells control arousal. They respond to stimuli in several sensory modalities, and when they respond, for example, to cutaneous stimulus, rather than having a receptive field on one small, small part of the arm, the way they would if they were in the motor cortex, they respond to the entire body. They have the characteristics which would allow, and the connectivity, which would allow them to uh, subserve generalized arousal. So these are the cells that I'm exciting, uh, excited about. And with my own two hands, what I'm doing is patch them recordings from what I jokingly call the master cells for arousal. That's how I motivate myself to go in and study them. In the mouse medullary reticular formation, and I have two purposes. One is, I wanted to, 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 to discover if these special cells are really special, do they have electrical cellular properties that produce their causation of arousal and even panic? I'll refer to that again in a moment. And secondly, I wanted to discover the transmitters and the peptides that they respond to. So what I do is I go in and I have an electrode which is uh, sucked onto the uh, membrane of the nerve cell of the sort that I just showed you. And I'm recording postsynaptic potentials in this cell here on an expanded time scale. I'm also applying a series of voltages to the cell so that I can generate a current voltage curve that not only tells me the resistance of the cell membrane, but it also shows me inflection points 
where a given current might kick in. And what I intend to do is a cost of a many, many, one, many of these cells to find out if they have special properties and eventually I'll find out what they respond to. I, uh, both uh, to, uh, increase their activity and would decrease their activity. Now one thing that's already exciting about these cells is that a Swedish postdoc in my lab, Lars Westberg, used a transgenic mouse in which the Connexin 36 promoter drives the gene that expresses green fluorescent protein, enhanced green fluorescent protein. And the important thing about Connexin 36 is that it is the protein which forms gap junctions. And so if you picture two nerve cells with membranes which are ordinarily insulated from each other, gap junctions are little secret tunnels that go from one membrane to the next and allow electrical excitation, ions, in this cell to be transmitted with zero resistance to the internal components of this cell. It would allow for the very rapid spread of electrical excitation. And what Lars did is here we have the brainstem on its side. The middle of it is here, the, the bottom of the brainstem is here, and the places that I've been recording are from these large cells right in here. And blown up and with higher magnification, we see some of these cells, I, I think this one is this one, and other high magnification right here, indicating that these giant cells in the lower brainstem reticular information from which I'm recording have the capacity to transmit electrical excitation to each other very rapidly. If I needed a system uh, which would very rapidly arouse the brain and maybe even produce panic if I'm running out of oxygen, for example, this is the kind of system that I would study. And so we hope to study that electrically in the future. Moving on to the functional genomics, we've already begun to show that genomics of CNS arousal uh, is experimentally attractive. We have three much different kinds of genes, three much different methodologies with positive results. Estrogen receptor is a nuclear receptor gene. We studied it with the null mutation, and we showed that estrogen receptor alpha, but not ER beta, is essential for increasing arousal in the, in the mouse behavior. Histamine receptor type 1, we used standard molecular pharmacology, and we showed that histamine receptor working through, histamine working through receptor type 1 increases arousal, but not other histamine receptor subtypes. Finally, here's an enzyme, prostaglandin D synthase, which we studied with a special technique called antisense oligomers, and we showed that prostaglandin D operating in the preoptic area <coughs> decreases arousal. In fact, if you put prostaglandin uh, into that area in any animal brain, the animal immediately goes to sleep. Um, we've just made a start, but this is going to be hard, and I'm only going to give you one specific example in order to illustrate uh, the kind of work that we're doing. The Harvard University Press book, uh, whose name is over, I think it's called uh, Brain Arousal and Information Theory, um, claims that more than 120 genes are responsible for regulating generalized arousal of the central nervous system. Now, it is clearly not the case that we leap immediately from generalized arousal to well-organized, biologically crucial behaviors. Instead, there are required gene-environment interactions. For example, in order to regulate reproduction, you have to have the physiological support of reproduction. Hunger controlled by more than 15 genes, thirst by more than 5 genes. In these lower animals, we have seasonal reproductive rhythms. We also have environmental constraints on crown reproduction fear and pain, and finally, social recognition and bonding uh, regulated by more than six genes uh, to date uh, foster sexual behavior. Now I've drawn this slide as though I know the hierarchy and maybe even the quantitative properties of these interactions, uh, which I've symbolized by the Greek letter pi. But in fact, I don't know the hierarchy and I don't know the quantitative interactions. I simply had to have something to make a slide because we know that these interactions exist and we can even work out their mechanisms. And I'll give you an example. The way I phrase the question is to ask how do generalized arousal mechanisms influence particular arousal states, like sexual arousal, thus to facilitate specific behaviors like reproductive behavior. And the current work uh, includes patch clamping on these ventromedial hypothalamic neurons that control sexual arousal and lordosis behavior. And to stay within time, uh, I'll talk today only about histamine. So histamine, working through histamine receptor type 1, 
these other ones are irrelevant, works through conventional signal transduction pathways, uh, and its uh, uh, output, as far as electrical activity is concerned, is that it phosphorylates a specific subunit of an NMDA receptor, which receives glutamate, the excitatory transmitter glutamate, and it decreases a potassium leak current. So what we wanted to say what, was have to ask the question, would histamine as a generalized arousal transmitter affect electrical activity in the ventromedial nucleus neurons that govern lordosis period? And the answer is yes. Here's uh, extracellular recorded activity, and histamine makes the electrical activity go up. Two other arousal-related transmitters also do. This is from the work of Li Mei Kao, uh, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine. But we wanted to know the exact ion channels through which the histamine works. We'd already worked out, we'd already ruled out calcium through long experiments that I'm not going to bore you with. But we discovered in this work of Stefan Pataki that uh, uh, sodium channels are not important. Tetrodotoxin blocks sodium channels, and the uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential right here, following histamine, is there even when we have tetrodotoxin in the bath, so sodium channels could not be necessary. What is necessary is potassium channels, because here we have the excitatory postsynaptic uh, potential from histamine application, and when we put in tetraethylammonium, potassium channel blocker, uh, there's no uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential at all. So our summary of that work from Stefan Pataki and from another postdoc in the lab, Jin Zhao, is that histamine produced in uh, tubromammillary nuclei of the hypothalamus, these hypothalamic neurons, acts through H1 receptors in conventional signal transduction pathways to reduce potassium currents in ventromedial hypothalamic neurons the consequences are increased sex behavior and, by the way, uh, reduced aggressive behavior. So we can go all the way from a specific ion channel, uh, potassium channels, and we're trying to discover now which one we think we know, through a specific receptor type, through a specific cell, all the way to a complete mammalian behavior. I'll finish up this part about mechanisms by offering the possibility that information theory math uh, sheds light on CNS arousal mechanisms. I argued in this Harvard University Press book a fairly obvious argument, I think, that arousal-related neurons in the central nervous system respond best to high information stimuli. These are salient stimuli, surprising stimuli, unpredictable stimuli. That led me very naturally uh, to the work of Claude Shannon, uh, who in 1948 devised an intuitively pleasing, mathematically precise definition of information. It was based on the concept of entropy from thermodynamics. And it would say that in a series of events, the total information is a sum of the probabilities of the individual events multiplied with the log of one over the probability. And therefore, in a binary choice between A and B, if the probability of A goes to zero, uh, then the sum goes to zero and the information is zero. That means if you know what's going to happen already, when it actually happens, it does not add to your information at all. And so the famous Shannon curve would say that in a binary choice, a maximum information, maximum shannon weaver information, is at the point of maximum uncertainty. Over here, where probability equals zero, if I were to tell you that it did not snow in Mexico City on July 4th, I wouldn't have told you any new information at all, because the a priori probability of that was close to zero. Of greater interest to the neuroscientist, he has probability of one, which is also very low information, and the reason for my being uh, interested in that is that information type of thinking yields a universal phenomenon in nervous systems, namely habituation. Here in a sea slug, a, a, a mollusk, here in a bird, here in a, in, a, in a human being, mindless repetition of the stimulus leads to decreased response. Arousal systems respect high information stimuli. As the information level goes down, the arousal goes down. I'd like to finish up the talk by talking about uh, arousal and awareness in humans. First, I'll start with normal human behavior, and I'll, I'll present a discussion for your consideration about the theory of the representation of one X to one's, one's X to oneself. This would be in normal behavior. And then I'll talk about clinical conditions in which my friend Nico Schiff deals with patients who are stuck suffering from vegetative and minimally conscious states.
First, for your consideration, I'd like to refer to the work of von Holtz, the physiologist von Holtz, and it's called reafference theory. And I'm going to try it and take this theory from impossibly concrete examples to examples of increasing content and increasing abstraction and see how long you'll stay with me, or for that matter, how long I'll stay with myself. Consider a person who's looking at a scene and he's looking straight ahead. Then he moves his eyeballs to the right. The point on the retina at which this scene impacts has now changed. It's changed from here to here, okay? And the question you have to ask is, did the world move to the left? Did the world move to the left? And the answer has to be no. How do we know, K and O W, that it is no? And the reason is that as the eyeball moves to the right, or for that matter, as we move our head to the right, there are oculomotor command signals which are fed back using the concept of corollary discharge, or efferens capi is the French is the German word. An oculomotor command signal, corollary discharge back to the visual system, such that the visual system has been instructed to expect the world to look as though it moved to the left, but it didn't actually, because we know, the CNS knows, that we moved our eyeball to the right. I'd like to take this simple principle and extend it to brain functions of increasing sophistication, uh, complexity, and abstraction. What I'm trying to say is that if we start out uh, through uh, two generations of work in neurophysiology and behavioral science, starting with the work of von Holtz and moving through the work of the engineer and psychologist of MIT, Richard Held, to the current neurophysiological work of Catherine Cummins, who's at uh, McGill University in Canada, we know very well that we can account for the stability of the visual field as we move our eyes and heads around by this corollary discharge concept. But now, I would like to extend this to the corollary discharge of all motor acts. This, uh, this is very close to the thinking of uh, Antonio Damasio, in which we have a sense of our own body, the movements we just made and the movements we're about to make, because of corollary discharge uh, for any movement in our body. And now things get a bit smokier, and I'd like to hear if you'd like to discuss this, because I can extend this principle of corollary discharge to verbal acts, uh, which means representation to oneself as oneself, as we speak to ourselves. And by the way, those verbal acts don't have to be explicit, they can be internal. We are aware of ourselves in part because we are the, indivi we are the only individuals who can represent our acts to ourselves, however sophisticated those acts are. Um, and by the way, the reason I began to think about representation of one's movements to oneself has to do with another book over here, which will come out December 1st, and it's called The Neuroscience of Fair Play, and it offers a parsimonious neuroscientific theory of how people manage to behave according to an ethical universal. So that'll come out from Dana Press uh, through University of Chicago in a couple of months. So I was thinking about the representation of one's acts to oneself, including covered verbal acts by which we talk to ourselves and I think account for at least one level of self-awareness. Now what's been going on during uh, central nervous system evolution to lead to higher layers of awareness is that we, uh, we humans are afforded a higher level of discrimination capacity, sensory discrimination capacity, a much greater motor repertoire, including now uh, the ability to speak. And we have incredible capacities with our mouths and with our hands compared to lower animals, which account for the sophistication with which we can represent our movements and our thoughts to ourselves, which I think go a long way towards explaining self-awareness without any mysticism at all, really based in solid neurophysiology. Let's switch from what I would call normal behavior to a very abnormal state. My friend, uh, Professor Nicholas Schiff uh, from the Department of Neurology at Cornell Medical School deals with patients who are in a comatose or a vegetative or a minimally conscious state. And here's his, um, here's Nico's, Nico Schiff's uh, depiction of the consciousness space. Increasing awareness is plotted from left to right. Increasing motor function is plotted from 
uh, bottom to up. So the locked in state is a person, a, a patient, who is totally conscious but who has no movement capacity at all. But of more serious consequence are those guys in the motorcycle accidents who come into the hospital in a comatose state. And if they're lucky, they move quickly through a vegetative state, through a minimally conscious state, uh, to a uh, full recovery. But lots of people don't, of course. And uh, the problem is, as, as Nico Schiff sees it, is that old-time neurologists in virtually all countries treat all of the vegetative state patients as the same. And especially under the rules of managed care these days, if the patient does not improve in the hospital with expert medical care over a period of two or three weeks, the patient is shipped off to a place where he gets palliative care, and you can pretty much, in, in most cases, forget about his mental life for the rest of his physical life. But what Nico Schiff has done is he's discovered a, 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 a subset of vegetative states, which he calls the minimally conscious state. And he himself has managed the care of patients as they move from the green arrow to the blue arrow from high-level, minimally conscious states over to the, uh, the state of, of course, they still have disabilities, but they can talk, they can feed themselves, they're much less of a burden to society and to their relatives. To indicate two slides uh, by which we can say minimally conscious state patients are different from vegetative state patients is that a vegetative state electroencephalograph is typically like a comatose state, whereas minimally conscious state patients can have patterns which are very similar to normal wakefulness. Uh, Nico has done this. And also, here's another paper of uh, Nicholas Schiff's that's published in Neurology. Consider a patient, consider people, listening to audio tapes that have been produced by the speech of their relatives. A true vegetative state patient will only have activation in the temporal cortex, the primary auditory receiving area. A tiny spot, not, not all of the screen area, but a tiny spot here or here or here. But a minimally conscious state patient has a much broader realm of responsivity to the uh, forward, oh, it's wrong. Um, <coughs> that's Greek, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what this means, this has been translated. Uh, it's been transliterated. You know something, my secretary may have done that to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'll have to speak with her. Uh, the, the, the minimally conscious state patient has activation over a much broader area of the brain. On the other hand, if you now do the experiment where you reverse the direction of the tape so that the, the frequency envelope and the uh, amplitude envelope is exactly the same, but the speech makes no sense, the normal subject, even though he's, he's demanded not to make, try to make sense of it, he tries to make sense. And the red areas are the areas of his brain which are activated by the overlap, both listening to the forward going tape and the reverse going tape, whereas the minimally conscious state patient has only a tiny area of red. So the minimally conscious state patient in this uh, fMRI study is better than a vegetative state patient, but not as good as a normal patient. Uh, Nicholas Schiff has been the doctor of a, of a guy um, who, re who recovered from the vegetative state after a period of 19 years. This is a man from Arkansas who had had a bad motorcycle accident. And this paper is now uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. And to make this very complicated figure um, easy to understand, I'm only going to compare part B, which is the uh, vegetative state guy's brain, with part E, which is a normal brain, normal control. These are sagittal sections. We're looking at the normal brain from the left side. The olfactory ball would be up here, the spinal cord down here. And we're looking at uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, patient's brain from the left side. You see that the, patient brain, the patient's brain suffered incredible loss of fibers. This is a technique called diffusion tensor imaging. And it shows that the corpus callosum, uh, fibers going from the left part of the brain to the right, has been severely damaged. This is, this is really bad brain damage in this patient's brain compared to the normal brain. But there's been a structural reorganization, structural reorganization of an area of the parietal cortex and the occipital cortex. And this has been associated with this guy's recovery from the vegetative state into a state of surely not normal consciousness, but consciousness is there. The fact is that nobody knows, uh, Dr. Schiff or Dr. Voss or anybody else, 
whether these fibers, going from the left to the right parietal brain, are the fibers responsible for the recovery. Therefore, in a new project at the Rockefeller University Hospital, we're going to be recording from patients like this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, asking three questions. What kinds of electrophysiological science precede recovery? Secondly, why do some people recover and not others? And thirdly, if we know why some recover and not others, can we foster recovery? And in fact, Dr. Schiff had a recent paper in Nature by which he stimulated, electrically stimulated the midline balance uh, right here, and he caused the recovery from a vegetative state into uh, a more normal state. It's only one patient, but one patient proves a lot. Summarizing, looking back, in hypothalamic neurons expressing estrogen receptors, estrogens influence several genomic modules to control a spinal, midbrain spinal circuit for this very simple hormone-driven lordosis behavior. And this work demonstrated for the first time that specific chemical reactions in specific parts of the brain determine a specific behavior. But now we want to look forward. Underlying all mammalian behaviors is central nervous system arousal. Precise operational definitions uh, feature sensory alertness, motor activity, and emotional reactivity. And for mice, uh, we have a high throughput assay. Using that assay and uh, electrophysiological recording, we understand some of the ways in which generalized arousal forces impact specific arousal states. The example that I gave you was histamine, but we also know about norepinephrine and acetylcholine. Themselves hormone dependent, they increase electroactivity in these behavior controlling neurons. And what we're doing now and looking forward is that we're creating mouse models of diffuse brain damage in mice. One model is to make the mouse anoxic, as though the mouse had died or had a stroke. Another model is a model of multiple sclerosis. And what we do is we try to make the mice have reduced arousal, and then we'll try for strategies which will ameliorate or even recover uh, from brain damage. This work has involved a lot of people, and Dr. Li Ming Kao has been with me at Rockefeller University for over 30 years. A lot of the work has been at the hands of Jin Zhao, I mentioned her name. Lars Westberg has returned to uh, Sweden. He's the person that did the work at the gap junctions. Uh, we, have a, we do we use viral vectors in our lab in order to influence um, a neuronal activity. Sergei Musatov is the virologist that does that work. Uh, we do simulation of neural nets. Uh, Mr. Dr. Tsai from MIT helps us with that. Uh, some of the work has been Deb Shelley, and I think I already said the need to be some. So I thank you very much, and I hope there are time for questions. Thank you, Professor Kraft. We certainly have time for questions. Don, Don, it's nice to look. Thank you. Uh, complex brain uh, cannot appear as it, it's true, and uh, it, it needs long history uh, uh, to develop such complex uh, brain through so development and evolution. And you mentioned that. Uh, uh, some brain group uh, within a brain, neural groups uh, responsible for uh, arousal uh, uh, processing, uh, there must be some uh, universal feature. And uh, I also guess that the developmental uh, process also must be similar. My question is, uh, there, there is increasingly uh, environmental pollution because uh, during be, being and becoming a uh, uh, system is developed based on interplay between uh, nature and nature. So since the environmental uh, pollution is increased, there must be something uh, drastic, drastically changed, uh, spread out, uh, in respect of species difference, I mean, uh, when the environment is polluted uh, one more, uh, some kind of similar abnormality may appear uh, from fish to uh, human. Do you have you ever heard about that or do you have any idea? Well, well first I'll, uh, I'll confirm the first part of your question. 
which is the preservation of some of these more primitive systems from the early vertebrate brain uh, to the human brain. And the reason that uh, I can say that with such certainty is that the way the brain evolved is that it started around the cerebral ventricles, which are like a landlocked lake. And that we have the fish brain closely adhering to those cerebral ventricles. But then, as the brain evolved, it evolved away from the ventricles, such that we have the reptilian brain, for example, the lizard brain, or, or maybe the frog brain, where we have the brain stem fairly well developed. But in the forebrain, it's only the lower part of the brain, uh, which is just above the roof of the mouth and maybe beneath the ears, uh, which is developed. And then we come to the higher mammalian brain, or the human brain, in which there's been this tremendous profusion upwards and forwards with the cortex, which comes from the word for rind, wrapping around the brain. And what's happened is that the cortex now, in order to talk to the spinal cord, sends axons, which, which are like the interstate highway, or like the Shinkansen, uh, that go very fast down to the spinal cord, but also with collaterals, maybe corollary discharge, uh, into the more ancient parts of the brain. So yes, that preservation is a well-accepted comparative neuroanatomical fact. Now because, it, with the generalized arousal concept, I've emphasized the most primitive neurons, and at breakfast this morning, you and I talked about the neurons that would pre be present in a fish brain, where if you touch the tail of the fish, pow, the fish is out of there. Uh, those same nerve cells are probably the ones that I'm recording from in the mouse brain. And therefore, if it is, in terms of comparative neuroanatomy, the same type of neuron, you would expect it to be sensitive to the same type of pollutant. And it, it would really be metabolic poisons, uh, mercury and lead, that I'd be thinking about first. But people who are more skilled um, in that kind of environmental chemistry than I could probably add many things to the list. Yes, I'm, I'm Olga Morrow, uh, University of Texas, Dallas. I, I have a question. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed your elegant uh, description of arousal. Uh, and, uh, but there was one thing that uh, maybe you didn't have time to talk about, sensory inputs. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for your first part about the sexual arousal, what do you think about uh, uh, the pheromones, uh, particularly pheromones in human? Of course, we know that pheromones play a big role in insects and so on, but also maybe in humans. And my other question was, um, what about the uh, ascending sensory systems uh, <clears throat> that use the uh, dorsal and medial thalamus? They have a heavy uh, collaterals to the uh, lower part of the reticular activating system, and that must uh, play a role in uh, in arousal. And if you have abnormalities in the use of these systems, as we know, they we have it, for instance, severe tinnitus, where those uh, dorsal uh, uh, thalamic systems seems to be more active than they are in normal, and also perhaps in autistic, some autistic individuals. So the first part of your question, or your first question, had to do with pheromones. The usual way of talking about it, and this is getting somewhat old-fashioned, is that we think of mice and rats and other lower animals as depending heavily on olfaction and pheromonal signals. So we call them macrosmotic species. Whereas humans, depending so much on our visual system and our auditory system, are, are often called microsmotic species because our olfactory bulbs are tiny compared to the elaboration of the rest of our brain. When you stop to think about it, that couldn't be entirely true because if it were entirely true, there would not be such a thing as the perfume industry or the deodorant industry. Uh, those industries depend upon the emotional importance of olfactory and pheromonal signals for humans. People will talk about sex differences in the ability to detect certain subtle chemicals. For, ex for example, the steroid androstenedione uh, is a sexual pheromone. And I can't remember, actually, who responds to it better, boys or girls. But there's definitely a, a claimed to be a difference between them. And um, chances are the connectivity of those pheromone-receiving systems even though they're not big in volume compared to the overlying cerebral cortex, 
the connectivity uh, is important enough. They know who, whom to speak to, so to speak, like a good politician, uh, uh, that, it, that there is considerable emotional importance in human beings as well. Just a moment of reflection will tell you that must be true. With respect to the dorsal thalamus, even though I emphasize the lower brainstem, I'm hardly going to argue against the dorsal medial thalamus. That's precisely where Dr. Nicholas Schiff stimulated with that vegetative state patient in order to bring that patient in a proven way out of a vegetative state into a state where that patient can speak and feed himself. And that would be in nature about three or four months ago. <clears throat> um, so the way Nico and I think about it is that there's at least two levels of evolution of how arousing stimuli tell the cerebral cortex that it better get busy. The first would be the lower one. It would be reticular neurons from the brainstem, as I was emphasizing, going through the hypothalamus to the basal forebrain, and the basal forebrain having cholinergic neurons there waking up whatever kind of forebrain uh, that animal has, which in a lizard is not very impressive. But as the thalamocortical system developed, uh, a, a phylogenetically newer system, uh, that would be now the high road. And what we haven't figured out is whether those two systems cooperate. So what I'm doing in the lab now, this is the work of Dr. Isabel Cruz, is we have electrodes in the, in the thalamus, actually sort of following up your question, uh, electrodes in the thalamus and electrodes in the basal forebrain. And what we want to do is to use low enough currents that we can find out if these two systems, the low road and the high road, somehow multiply each other. Or could it be exponential? Or do they get in each other's way? What's the answer? Uh, we don't have the answer yet. Thank you very much. Uh, being, uh, being a neurosurgeon, they started from you. Uh, I'm very impressed first by your lecture, of course, but also about the fantastic effect about the deep brain stimulation. Uh, I could have read my nature a bit more carefully, but uh, I'd like to ask you, was that stimulation directly correlated? So when you gave the stimulation, the patient woke up, and then you stopped stimulation and fell down back into his state? Here's, here's what happened. And probably you not only missed it in nature, but you missed it in the New York Times and uh, uh, American Network News. <clears throat> here's the way it worked. The patient had had, as I recall, a motorcycle accident. The patient had been in a vegetative state for seven years. But Nico, uh, working uh, with the history of his great former mentor, Fred Plum, uh, the father of, of uh, neuro neurologic diagnosis in a way, had uh, clinical skills that allowed him to detect that that patient was probably a high-end vegetative state patient, the kind of patient who would be in a minimally conscious state. Um, he got his stimulation parameters adjusted, it was uh, concentric bipolar uh, st stimuli. And the very first time he, he gave 50 pulses per second, the patient had motor signs, as I recall, just motor signs, that went up. Then he turned, I think it was one hour of stimulation, but I'm not sure. When he turned the stimulus off, the patient's function went back down. And as I recall, it was one or two hours of stimulation per day. But then, and this is the most exciting part, with increasing bouts of stimulation, there came to be a, what we call, or what Nico calls, a carryover effect. It actually confused the reviewers of his paper because they said, ha, huh, look at this. During the off period, the patient uh, is still having increased function, whereas, of course, that's exactly what the doctor wants. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a carryover effect for the rest of the patient's life? Uh, but yes, there came to be a carryover effect after a while. And now, of course, it's, they're obliged to carry on with other patients to show how generalizable this is. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, I'm an uh, environmental ecologist. Or, uh, no, no, I mean the toxic, ecotoxicologist. And uh, in Japan, we uh, formed a big team in which we try to understand uh, environmental contamination with the uh, uh, endocrine disruption systems. And uh, your uh, presentation is very uh, stimulating to us to understand further the pollution with the human behavior. And my question is the, uh, the person who has a difficulty of sex identification. And when we compare the men and women in the uh, sex identification programs, the men uh, patient showed a 
very wide spectra of the uh, difficulties in sex identification. Some uh, had a very li li light difficulties. Some had a very deep difficulty with sex identification. But in the women's case, a very, very narrow spectra of sex difficulty of sex identification. Then my question is, the, uh, because of estrogen as acceptor, alpha, the, uh, among men uh, who had difficulty of sex identification, how or when he developed such a, such a way? And our interpretation, probably my interpretation, it, 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 during the development stage, in fetus stage, when the brain was formulated, during the very critical period, some, some kind of a hormone, female hormones, uh, exposure to him through her uh, mother, uh, uh, you know, bodies. So during the formation of the brain, if, if such a, a, a stimuli, the hormone stimuli, uh, especially the female hormone stimuli to the main uh, baby, bo uh, baby uh, male, bo uh, male, you know, uh, fetus, it, that, that it cause, you know, the possibility of the uh, sex identification problems? So I think I can answer that question at three levels. The first is, yes, there are, uh, for the parts of the audience that don't know, there's a major field uh, that works on, on the possibility of what they call endocrine disruptive chemicals. And one of the leaders of that field in the States is Fred von Saal, and for people who are interested, I can give a reference to that. And all, it's also true that endocrine signals rooted through the circulation from the mother, including the stress to the mother, just stress to the mother causing tremendous adrenal hypertrophy and adrenal hormone uh, uh, elaboration can be disruptive to the endocrine development of the baby. Okay, that's the clear part. Now things get a little less clear. Um, in terms of sexual identification and mate choice isn't as simple as um, hormones circulating in the baby. Not only do we have hormones circulating in the baby, but we also have the normal formation of the genitalia, which is a major issue. Do, do, does the penis and the vagina and so forth really get formed the way it should? Then we have prenatal stress. Then we have the impact of neonatal treat, treatment by, of the baby shortly after birth. Then we have critical events during puberty. Uh, then we have uh, environment, uh, we have familial attitudes, and we have uh, uh, cultural habits. And earlier in this meeting, they're flashed by on one of the screens, the name Waddington. And in 1957, the great British uh, evolutionary biologist, C.H. Waddington, had a picture of developmental trajectories in which, and I cannot do this exactly with my hand, he had the ball at the top of the hill, but like a ski course, like in the Japanese Alps. Uh, there were many ways of getting down, many choice points. And the way the ball would roll down this groove, and then that groove, and then that groove, finally to arrive at one of an infinite number of places at the bottom, depended upon a whole series of choices. And I think that uh, sexual differentiation and mate choice and sexual identification is like that. That you've identified one of the most chemically clear ways of the ball rolling down the hill. But like C.H. Waddington, we have all of these other forces as well. Finally, in terms of the number, the relative numbers of people with ambiguous sexual identification between males and females, I'm not so sure that it's true that the number is much greater for males than females. Um, uh, once I was in Greenwich Village in New York City, and I happened to be there on the day of the Lesbian Pride Parade, the Lesbian Pride Parade. And I was, one, I was on one side and I wanted to get to the other side. Uh, it was a very long parade. And so I think when we talk about cultural influences on relative numbers of males and females with sexual identification problems, that there may be cultural issues there uh, that would be different in one culture than another. So it's coming back to Leif's question and about the deep brain stimulation which can possibly pull the patient up out of a minimally conscious state. Um, do you think there's, that there's any beh a behavioral input or I mean, natural input one could use other than an artificial electrical stimulation which could do the same trick? Um, you emphasized just uh, the Shannon measure of, of randomness as being the most uh, I mean, measure of how arousing something's going to be. In fact, of course, it's probably not 
uh, I mean, the most stu uh, salient stimulus has not been the most, most unexpected one. Your own results show already that, for example, reversed speech, which is more unexpected, is not so good as arousing somebody as direct speech, which has meaning. The real fascinating question would be, is uh, some kind of magical verbal formula, some, some kind of input to these patients, which can get through and arouse the, the right part of the brain using normal sensory channels. Is there something, if only we could hit on it, which we could say to this guy, um, uh, not his own name, it's not going to work, but something, and can one imagine the case in which that would actually, uh, if only we could find it, uh, do the same trick as the, as the artificial stimulation? I think these patients are bad enough off uh, that what you're talking about is probably not going to work by itself. On the other hand, I think Nico would say, Dr. Schiff would say, that in concert with straight medical approaches, the presence of loved family ones, the presence of stimuli that have high emotional content is likely to bring out normal responsive behavior much better than, than the absence of same. So let's take it that if the patient's in bad enough state, uh, chances are some kind of uh, heroic electrical stimulation or something like that is going to be necessary. We can move on from there and say, is electrical stimulation the entire story? No, clearly over the next few years, we're going to be talking about hormonal and neurochemical adjunct therapies, which will take the, some of the burden off the medial thalamic stimulation, if that's what it's going to be. And finally, in the case of people who are more in the normal range, who did not have that motorcycle accident, but do want to manipulate their arousal states, there's the entire field of behavioral modification, which started with B.F. Skinner, but has elaborated from there. And for that matter, meditation is a, is a form of self-manipulation. You decide you're going to put yourself in such and such a state, and by practicing long enough, you get there. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be every possible component that works in order to achieve the highest level of function is going to be the answer. It's going to be a chord that has many notes.